Welcome everyone to the Underserved Population Network event from Home Health Quality Improvement National Campaign. So we want to thank everybody for this afternoon for coming out. We're so pleased. Many of you are coming today's presentation, the Home Health Scope of Practice for Therapists. Um, today with us are many of the HHQI team, and I'm probably missing a few folks, but we have the RN project coordinators, Cindy Sun, Crystal Welsh, also Sharon Miller, and myself, Misty Kevich. We personally want to welcome you all. Today also is Misty Dyke, our communications specialist, and Andrea Lefke, our ICQ uh, coordinator. I'm going to do a few housekeeping um, activities and some announcements before we get started, and then we're going to jump right into the presentation because there's going to be a lot of great information for you. There are two handouts posted under the Underserved Population tab on HHQI, and Misty Dyke has posted a link uh, earlier in the chat uh, feature for you to find the slides. There are the slide PowerPoints, but also if you downloaded them earlier um, yesterday or early this morning, there is a second um, a posting that just went up this morning, Medication Management and Physical Therapy Therapist, and it's from the APTA, literally hot off the press. So you do want to go out and download that as well. There will be a lot of information presented today uh, by our two experts, and we know you're going to have many, many questions. So we want you to write your questions as you think about them in the Q&A box or in the chat box. Uh, that way we're able to gather the questions. We're not going to be able to auditory entertain your questions because there's uh, too many folks that are on the line today. And then at the end when we're ready to do the Q&A, then we'll facilitate those questions as time permit. And any questions that we're unable to get to for time, we will answer those um, afterwards. So we will make sure that all questions are answered. There will be an evaluation that will you'll be prompted to as you close out of the session today. Please take time, it's very short, to complete. Include the information of the number of people that are at your site, that's very important. And also, the ideas in, in the comment section of what you'd like to see underserved population topics in the future. Our calls now are, are quarterly in phase four, and we're very interested in knowing what you are interested in that we can provide assistance. So with that, um, I am going to move into one additional clarification. We did send out a postcard reminder last week with some two exciting um, announcements or reminders, one being this webinar today, which we're very excited, and the other was an announcement of HHQI University. Now, they were two distinct postings, but they were like back-to-back, -back. so some people have kind of thought that there are continuing ed credits being that are offered through this session, and there are not. So we apologize for any misunderstanding. That, um, but we are very excited to tell you real quickly about HHQI University, and what we will do is ha show you just a flyer, and we will post a link into the chat box as well, where to get the flyer and some information on the university. With um, HHQI, we are providing now um, and a very nice, very simple, uh, free, self-paced online educational courses that are evidence-based. They're appropriate for nurses, therapists, social workers, and leadership. You can click on, you can get free continuing education. Typically, that will be for nursing. We are still investigating and trying to find ways that we can provide certificates for the therapists, especially physical therapists, because there is not a national organization that is accepted in all the states, but many of your organizations, your state or your national, if you're an OT speech, um, and perhaps even physical therapists, will still take certificates from another organization. These CEs are approved through the American Nurses Credentialing Center through the Alabama uh, State Nurses Association, so they are uh, appropriate in all of the states um, with just a minor um, 
with uh, California and Iowa, you do have to check to make sure you're only allowed a certain number outside of your state. But you can find all of that information and much more uh, when you go to the HHQI University site. There's a, um, a handout for a quick guide to get started, and there's FAQs for CEs that you can look at. Currently in HHQI University, and you have to do um, be registered for the campaign and then just do a real short registration. We apologize, but there was no way around it for the um, university, but it's very simple. You do it once. Currently we have a 1.0 continuing ed course that's already uh, posted on um, the state of, home, of cardiovascular health. There is a new student orient, orientation, no CEs with it, but if it's a 10-minute quick presentation to show you around the site. And then on Monday, uh, February the 2nd, a new course is going to be posted. It's the Fundamentally Focused Blood Pressure Control and Smoking Cessation, and it will be worth 1.5 CEs. Do check every month. We provide Usually, we'll be providing something almost every month, so do check in. So with that, we're going to go ahead and go right back to our presentation, and I'm going to introduce our speakers. We are very pleased today to have Bud Langham, who is a physical therapist for 15 years, and he's held leadership roles in various of post-acute care settings. He currently serves as the Chief Clinical Officer of Encompass Home Health and Hospice, which is based out of Dallas, Texas. He leads the company's efforts to promote evidence-based practice, patient-centered care, and innovative care practices with the goal of achieving the highest level of quality and patient satisfaction. Bud has published various articles on value-based purchasing, case management, and morality for the physical therapist in the home. Bud attended the University of Oklahoma for his bachelor's and master's, and he and his wife, Jill, have children, three boys, ages one to nine. And Ken, Dr. Ken Miller is a clinical educator for Catholic Home Health in New York, where he provides staff development through its in, interdisciplinary orientation, competency, and preceptor programs. Additionally, he serves as a guest lecturer and adjunct teaching assistant in the BPT program at the Turo College in Bayshore, New York. He's presented at the combine section meetings of the APTA, the annual conference of NOC, and on a variety of topics including objective testing, professionalism, interdisciplinary team modeling, osteoporosis, different diagnoses of dizziness, documentation, and home health regulation. So he serves also as the chair of the practice committee of the home health section of the American Physical Therapy Association, as well as on the editorial boards for the Jerry Note publication, the Journal of Novell Phys Physiotherapy and Physical Medicine, and is a manuscript reviewer for several journals. Dr. Miller has authored, authored many uh, articles for the Journal of Geriatric physical therapy, Jerry notes, and quarterly report news uh, letter. So with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Bud and to Ken. Thank you, Misty, very much. Uh, we are very glad to be here today. Uh, Ken and I talk about these uh, topics quite a bit in our everyday lives, and uh, we're certainly very passionate about the role of therapists in home health and healthcare in general. So. I hope that comes across today, and I apologize for my voice. I'm a little under the weather, uh, but I hope uh, everybody can hear me okay. So today, Ken and I are going to talk about the role of PT, OT, and SLPs in home health. Specifically, we're going to talk about scope of practice and professional expectations of those disciplines. We're going to try in the end to talk about how you can engage your therapist and move them forward with these new expectations into a more comprehensive uh, approach to care. And so you can see the description here on the slides. Apologize for being a little behind. So that's our goal for today, and we, we hope we can help, uh, help everybody get there. Some common points of conflict that, that Ken and I see, and you may see others, in scope of practice, we, we hear this quite a bit, that there's a, a debate, an ongoing debate about vital signs and what is and what is not within the scope of practice of these different therapy disciplines. Uh, and of course, medication management. Tremendous debates about 
the role of therapist in that particular intervention, and we'll try to shine some light on that today, including auscultation and then OASIS completion as well. So those are the scope of practice areas that we're going to discuss to try to give you some references to support our positions. Uh, and I think we'll both be comfortable presenting how we've done this in our own organizations and where we stand. Professional expectations, uh, a lot of discussion around therapists in case conference, uh, leadership roles for therapists, uh, agency roles for therapists, including the role of therapy disciplines in the QAPI process and, uh, as well, and then expectations of contractors. What can you expect of contractors? and uh, what have we done to kind of help uh, move the expectations forward uh, for therapists in clinical practice when we when we talk about contractors? So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Ken to start off the uh, discussion of scope of practice. Uh, thank you, Bud. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad I'm able to be here today. We had two feet of snow in New York, and uh, luckily we were able to shovel out and did not lose power. So here here we are. Just, just three points I just want to make before we go through the rest of the slides. First thing is, I, Bud and I were very intentional about looking at the resources uh, related to PT, OT, and speech therapy. Uh, if you look through the slides and it looks like it's uh, physical therapy centric, uh, this is not intentional in any way. It's just that when we looked at the research and looked at the uh, available resources, there was much more uh, robust amount of information from the physical therapy uh, association that was available to us uh, than what we saw in OT or uh, ASHA. And so we encourage uh, occupational therapy uh, professionals and uh, speech language pathologists uh, to go back to your associations uh, if you feel that there's information lacking that you would like to have them uh, create position statements or create uh, guidance documents. Because as far as the physical therapy literature, we were able to find some, and where we found it lacking for OT and SLP, uh, we just provided what we were able to find. So that's the first point is we were intentional about not making it uh, physical therapy centric. The other thing is with all of the resources you see with all of the different um, citations that Bud and I have for this today's lecture, just realize that regulations are a moving target and that documents become dated sometimes very quickly. And so we just want you to always look through your uh, documents and, and look for do, do your due diligence, and you can see that is on the slide, uh, to make sure that you're looking at the most current information available. Uh, the third thing is, and, and this is the most important part of, of today's presentation, is Bud and I are not looking to spoon feed anybody. Um, we both feel that that's the meaning to just be saying, hey, do this and give a recipe. Um, really, the motto that we both have is we would rather teach you how to fish so that you can eat for life rather than just hand you the fish. So as you see us go through the slides, you're going to see us say these are things that you need to go back and research because state practice acts are all individual and, you know, we all have a commonality with federal regulations, but where state practice acts determines uh, largely scope of practice, you need to be able to go back to the state regulations and the states have it divided up into different uh, parts of the state. It could be a professional board. It could also be the Department of Health uh, determining what is considered scope of practice uh, or not. So when you look at your, um, at your scopes of practice, um, you know, just bear in mind that you should annually update uh, and, and annually review federal as well as state regulations. And, and that's probably the biggest thing I would write on this slide is make sure that you do your diligence annually to make sure that what you're providing to your staff is, is the most current information. So with that, let's move on to the scope of practice. Uh, like I mentioned, it's primarily determined by the State Practice Act. State Practice Acts may be silent, where you may look up a specific topic and see what the State Practice Act is on that specific item, and you may not be able to find any information at all, or you may find that it is listed specifically in the State Practice Act and it could either be permissive, which is allowable, or it might be restrictive, where it's saying that it's, it's not part of the, the scope of practice uh, for e any of the three disciplines. So it's pretty easy if it says it's restrictive or permissive, now you have rules to follow. Just make sure that you're compliant with those rules and you're good to go. Uh, the issue that, that we find is, for the most part, uh, a lot of the specifics we're trying to get answers to are not laid out in the scope of practice. So when you want to look up uh, coagulate check or you want to look up specifics, are therapists allowed to remove 
uh, staples and sutures, these things may or may not be in the Practice Act, and for the most part, they're silent. And then you have to do other things related to whether you have your staff do that or not. And, and that's what I want to talk about with researching the curricula. As far as all three professional associations, there are um, regulations and standards regarding what is taught on the educational level for each of the disciplines. So if you have an idea of something that you're not sure a therapist is allowed to do and your, and your state practice act is silent on that issue, the first place that I recommend going to would be uh, going to the professional association and going to either ACADI, CAPTI, or the Council on Academic Accreditation and see what they have listed that specifically the curricula being taught to students of those three disciplines. The, the next thing is you, I would recommend going to the different professional associations regarding position statements that they may have or guidance documents that may be available related to the specific topic you're trying to research. And lastly, and, it's, and we listed these in this order specifically, uh, lastly would be to go to the state board regarding asking questions. Um, you definitely need to go to the federal regulation first, as well as going to the state uh, regulations, because those are the law. But as far as asking questions for clarifications of items, that's where I would, I would be careful for what you ask for. Because if, if something is silent and you ask a question, they might make it more restrictive than if you were to follow other um, steps that we're about to go over related to developing uh, competency, where it would be legal and ethical for you to have therapists do certain tasks because it might be in their curriculum, which means that they were taught how to do these specific um, procedures or how to do these specific um, uh, processes in, in during the course of their um, their visits. But if you go to the state board and say, are we allowed to do this, then we're giving them um, the prerogative to say, oh, no, you can't do that, and thank you for bringing it to our attention. So, you know, just be careful what you ask for. Um, get your responses in writing. So if you do go to the state board or any of these associations, you know, we all know that if it's if it's done verbally, you know, we, it hasn't, um, it, we don't have any proof of it being, um, of what they told us after the fact. So make sure whatever information you ask for a clarification, you get it back in, in writing. Uh, engage therapists and create policies and competencies. You know, where there is silence, you know, creating a policy for your agency and creating competencies to assure that patient safety is being maintained. Um, that would be the appropriate approach to try to have therapists involved in doing things that they may not feel comfortable. Uh, first thing is you have to uh, create the policy and competency, a, a big part of that is education, making sure that the, the therapists feel educated and knowledgeable re related to whatever the task might be. And I think as we move through the slides, you'll see that that's one of the biggest stumbling blocks is therapists, they're just unsure of their ability to do something because they're unfamiliar with whatever the item is we want them to do. And then lastly, engage the therapist in the training. Let them help to lead that discussion and lead the training themselves so that they feel that they're more involved and it's not just me telling you to do something. Okay, but you can move on, very good. So common myths in home health. You know, if you look at all of these the bullet lists that I have here uh, that Bud and I put together, I don't want you to, I'm not going to cover each item for, for uh, sake of time, but if any of these items listed uh, ring a bell to you, like, oh, I didn't know this, or I didn't know that, throw Bud or I a question, because these are all falsehoods. These are all myths. So um, just take a look through the item 150-foot rule. We had a 10-visit rule. Uh, more recently, you heard about therapy lupus. So just take a look through the list. If there's any questions about these items, uh, you can shoot us a question, and we can answer that uh, later on. So now a question that comes to me is, can OTs do wound care? So I went to the federal regulation, and this is where we want to teach you how to fish. So I went to the federal regulation and found that it's not, a restricted, uh, it's not restricted by CMS. So then the second thing is I went to the State Practice Act, and I live in New York, so I went to the New York State Practice Act specifically, and there's no information to say that they're not allowed to do any type of wound care or that they are allowed to do wound care. And you may find this in your state as well. 
So at this point, I went to the AOTA uh, curriculum, and I found that master's prepared OTs uh, going to school currently are being trained in the integumentary system, and that is part of their, uh, part of their core curriculum. So then that leads me to the question is, well, should we, um, should we develop competence for these clinicians, or, or could we? Well, we definitely could because AOTA has it in their curriculum. And the next question is, well, should we? And really to answer that question, my answer is everything related to competency has to do with patient safety and making sure that at a minimum, everyone is at a specific standard level of uh, providing care. So should competency be established would be something where I would need to go back to my staff and look at the qualities that my staff have and look at what their skill sets are and possibly see how many OTs or masters prepared that have been trained in the integrity system or versus how many uh, OT, OTs we have that are um, uh, bachelor's trained or may have been practicing for quite a long time prior to AOTA adding the curriculum to their um, the integumentary system to that curriculum. So that's a question you'd have to answer specifically by agency, and then develop policy if you feel that you should be um, instituting this practice. How would competency be established? This is something that I'm deeply involved with in my agency, and what we do in our agency is, first thing is we try to create the educational plan of what are we actually looking to accomplish, and then we teach based on what we're looking to accomplish. And then what we do is we go to the research, find evidence-based information. Uh, we include other disciplines, so we have WOCNs involved. And what we do is we develop what the actual curriculum will be for that, and then we develop a policy and that curriculum uh, side by side. And then what we do is we develop some way of establishing, uh, evaluating that competency, whether it's a practical, whether it's a written test, whether it's observation in the field, whether it's working on, on models or, or human beings. So we, evaluate, we develop some type of evaluation. And then from that point, once we have these things in place and we include OTs along the process, then what we do is we figure out how we're going to communicate this to the OTs so that they need to understand this has now become part of their job description. And we try to be very clear about what their duties are. So that way we try to clear up any misconceptions about what our goal is. And, um, and what we want them to be able to do in the field. And uh, as far as wound care, in my agency, when we had uh, PTs starting to do wound care, uh, one thing that came up was some nurses felt that they were going to be X'd out of making visits. And so we needed to define what the PTs would be doing versus what they would not be doing related to wound care so that we could allay any fears the nurses had uh, when we went into implementing uh, PTs doing wound care. Currently, we don't have the PTs doing wound care uh, at our agency uh, for other logistical reasons that I won't go into now. Uh, but just to learn from the mistakes that we made at that point, and this is a few years ago, involve all disciplines and make sure that you're clear about what the intent of the competency is when it's something new for uh, the discipline, especially with other disciplines feeling that people might be treading on uh, a scope of practice issue, which apparently this is not. Okay, but you can move on to the next slide. Thank you, Ken. Okay, vital signs. Here we go. So this is probably the first part of the presentation where any therapist on the call will start planning to come after me. Uh, can therapists assess vital signs? Uh, the first bullet point is intentionally in all caps. Yes, of course they can, and they should. OTs, PTs, and SLPs can and should assess vital signs. Think about it from this perspective, and this is how we communicate it to our therapist uh, at our company. When we create a plan of care in home health, we put vital sign parameters on the plan of care, and we're responsible for reporting to the physician who oversees that plan of care any time a patient is outside specified parameters. So how can we do that? if some of the disciplines caring for these patients aren't assessing those vital signs. We can't. So in our organization, it's mandatory for all disciplines in the home to assess vital signs, to document them, 
And we've done that for quite a while. Uh, when we have new people come on board, it does create some interesting conversations, but let me help you with how to have those conversations. Um, the home health agency has to educate, has to be willing to educate and validate competency in assessing vital signs when clinicians come on board and regularly. <clears throat> So down at the bottom of this slide, you'll see a statement from ASHA, from the American Speech, Language, and Hearing Association. This was written in 1996. This is a document called the Multi-Skilled Personnel Position Statement. It's a position statement they put forth where they say, and this is a quote straight from the statement, and we'll see some more on the next slide, cross-training of basic patient care skills includes routine, frequently provided, easily trainable, low-risk procedures such as suctioning patients, monitoring vital signs, and transferring and positioning patients. And so here we have a statement from ASHA where they say that monitoring vital signs is a basic patient care skill and cross-training uh, may be uh, warranted. And so most speech pathologists don't have vital sign training in their program. They may get that in their uh, clinical education after graduation, or they may not. But what we've committed to is having a competency in place to make sure that we educate and validate competency in assessing vital signs. And so what our message to speech pathologist is, you don't necessarily have to take vital signs to practice in home health, but you do to practice in our agency. So that's a line in the sand that we've drawn, and it's uh, garnered some attention for sure, but uh, we've been very successful with that. Now let's talk about medication management, another big one. So when it comes to medication management, the federal regulations don't restrict PT, OT, or SLP from performing this particular intervention um, from the drug regimen review. But we do know that the conditions of participation require a drug regimen review as part of the comprehensive assessment. Uh, this can, of course, be a collaborative task. So. What we have done and what we would recommend is to have a backup system in place to support therapists when they're trying to perform this drug regimen review, uh, to have a nurse in the office be available to, do, to help with this over the telephone, uh, to leverage technology to assist, because therapists are going to need some additional support. So the APTA <clears throat> has a statement on medication management. The very latest uh, was uploaded for you guys to review. Uh, to the uh, file share. AOTA addresses this, and ASHA addresses this uh, in a way as well. Um, it is so important to review the State Practice Act, and this is where I would put it back on the therapist uh, at your agency to say, you need to know what your State Practice Act says, so do this research for me, and then validate that research. But the states are very different in how they approach uh, medication, man medication management. Uh, not only in scope, but in how they define the actual practice. What are we really asking for when we use the term medication management? It immediately strikes fear in all therapists. And so try to communicate to them, we're not asking you to do an assessment, then contact the physician and recommend a change in the dose for Metaprolol. We're not asking you to go to that level. You're not an RN. We're not asking you to understand medications at that level or make those suggestions. Here's what we're really asking for when we talk about medication management relative to the home health setting and the drug regimen review requirement. It goes back to that particular requirement. So we're looking at all client medications for any potential adverse effects and drug reactions, including these are the five things we're really looking for. Ineffective drug therapy. So if somebody's on an antihypertensive medication, but they're obviously hypertensive when you arrive to do your visit, that's an indication that that may be ineffective drug therapy. Maybe the medication isn't working like it's supposed to be. And so that would warrant a conversation with a nurse in the office or the physician and overseeing the plan of care. Significant side effects. Significant drug interactions. And here's where technology can really help because none of us can remember all of these drug interactions. Technology can really help with number three, duplicate drug therapy. So if a therapist arrives at a patient's home and they have three different narcotic medications from three different physicians with three different time points from the prescription, that may be an indicator that there's duplicate drug therapy and then noncompliance with drug therapy. 
So these are the five things that we're really asking therapists to have a stronger role in in home health when it comes to medication management, to recognize these problems and to act upon them. And in some instances, that's going to mean contacting the physician to discuss it. And in some instances, that's going to mean contacting the home health agency office to talk to a nurse or a case manager for collaborative guidance there. But this is what we're really asking for. And so I think when you communicate this level uh, of expectation to therapists, it kind of lowers their guard a little bit. They don't become so apprehensive. Now, the role of therapist in medication management has been addressed through the APTA. This is the previous uh, position statement. Uh, I'm just going to read what's in quotes here at the top of this slide. So it says, physical therapist, patient and client management, integrated and understanding of a patient's or client's prescription and non-prescription medication with consideration of its impact upon health, impairments, functional limitations, and disabilities. The administration and storage of medication used for PT interventions is also a component of patient or client management and thus within the scope of physical therapist practice. So when I've had many, many, many discussions with therapists about their role in medication management and home health, we take them back to the drug regimen review guidelines and we take them back to this position statement. Whether or not they're members of the APTA, this position statement reflects upon all of us in the field and not just members of the agency. Down at the bottom of the slide, <clears throat> you'll see a similar document from the AOTA. This is a fact sheet from 2013, and this is about the OT's role in home health. And so here they're addressing OTs, and it says, you're also concerned about your patient's ability to manage their condition. Management of chronic conditions is a large, in large part, management of daily activities. O Occupational therapy brings expertise to help patients translate doctor's orders, in quotes, to manage daily habits and routines. And it goes on to say, related to medication management, that OT addresses strategies to enhance medication adherence and integrate medication management into the patient's daily routine. So what I would tell you with my experience in home health is, our OTs have a vital role in medication management and recognizing those five problems on the prior slide, but more importantly, in helping patients develop strategies to take their medications effectively as an intervention to address some of those problems. Hey, Bud, I just would like to add, related to uh, the medication management with the therapies, and this is not related, this talk is not about um, social work, Many social workers work in multiple settings, and getting the social workers involved in these same five areas, uh, looking at the effect of drug therapy, um, does the patient have any pain and address any type of chronic pain issue, um, is, is just part of their uh, scope as well. Uh, you just have to be clear about what their intentions are. Uh, a quick example for our agency when we train our, our social workers is we have the social workers look to see that the patient is able to uh, buy the purchase their medication. So we look at the psychosocial aspects of medication management and medication adherence. Uh, do they have other caregivers in the home that might be taking their pain medication and selling their narcotics or, or have uh, abusing their uh, narcotics, um, the patient's narcotics? So just the medications is such an important area of home health and, and that's the bread and butter for our uh, or all of our uh, agencies to make sure that we do as much as we can to get that correct, to try to limit any adverse drug reactions, and try to keep our patients safe and, and keep them out of the hospital. Yeah, I completely just to add that piece to it. Thanks, Ken. So back to the speech pathologist. Now, there is no, there is no official statement on medication management for ASHA that we could locate. Uh, this is a continuation of the same document, the position statement, uh, that we were referring to earlier. And so in this statement, and we had it highlighted, but it doesn't seem to show on the screen. But here, ASHA says that cross-training of clinical skills is not appropriate at the professional level of practice, but cross-training of basic patient care skills is a reasonable option. And so on the next slide, we'll see them go a little bit further. And again, we had this highlighted, but it's not, not showing, but I'll let you find it as you read through the information. Here's the glossary from that document where they talk about cross-training of clinical skills. Down below in cross-training of basic patient care skills, you'll notice at the very last of that, 
where it says home care patients' compliance with prescribed medications can be verified by clinicians already coming to the home on a regular basis. And so that's what we would like to have from the SLPs is, again, going back to those five points of the drug regimen review and having anybody who's in the home with a professional license verify uh, compliance with their prescribed medications. And so we think that's really key information. These documents have been helpful to move these discussions forward. So I'm going to hand it back to Ken. He's going to talk about auscultation. Okay, but you can advance it one more slide. So the question comes up, like we talked about occupational therapists with wound care, now we're going to be more general. Can therapists auscultate? And the answer again is yes. The question is, are they competent? And as a physical therapist by license myself, I know that while I was in PT school, I was trained in how to listen to breath sounds and how to listen to the different uh, heart sounds. And the issue is, am I competent today to be able to do that? And are, are the staff that I work with competent to do that? And the, the, the answer to that question is, well, if they haven't been doing it, um, are they competent? And the answer is probably not at this point. So to tell a therapist that they need to just start listening for breath sounds uh, is inappropriate. You know, time and uh, resources needs to be invested in training them how to do uh, breath sounds properly. Now, are we expecting them to listen to the heart and be able to hear all of the different uh, heart sounds that a cardiologist hears? Absolutely not. Are we asking them to hear the same exact um, sounds and be able to document the way a pulmonar uh, pulmonologist does? Absolutely not. And the bottom slide says keep it simple, normal or abnormal. So report abnormal findings and symptoms. So basically you want to keep it at a lower level, a more basic level, and try to have it so is this, are they hearing normal or abnormal sounds? And if it's abnormal, then do the proper thing and refer that either to the, to the nurse or to the physician, okay? Again, don't expect the same level because we are trained differently and nurses are trained much more so in, in auscultation and therapists. So, but that doesn't uh, excuse a therapist from doing it at all. Um, therapists should be uh, trained and competent in that, uh, in listening to breath sounds and be able to determine if the patient has fluid in their lungs or potential to have fluid in their lungs and then refer that patient to that physician or the nurse more quickly and timely. And again, that'll help prevent um, rehospitalization. Okay, but you can move on to OASIS. So Oasis, when you think of Oasis, I know no one thinks of the beach with the uh, pina colada any longer, we're not thinking Oasis and, and the other uh, meaning for it. But if you look at the start of care Oasis, CMS regulations, and again, if you don't have these, uh, don't take my word for it or, or Bud's word for it. Go to the regulation, get the actual um, conditions of participation, and take a look at what it says. So it does say if a nursing order exists, an RN must perform a start of care visit not based on uh, availability of uh, staff. It's not a matter of, well, you know, the therapist can go in in the morning and do a starter care and then see if the nurse is needed. That's not how it works. If, if the referral has a need for nursing from the beginning, then the nurse needs to go in first and then the therapist would follow after. Uh, therapy only cases, uh, PT or speech may perform the starter care. That's uh, federal uh, regulations for Medicare, CMS with Medicare. If you have a, a case that's a, a therapy-only case and they identify there's a need for a nurse, um, then they certainly can call the physician, get an order, and have the nurse uh, added to the plan of care. Uh, in Medicare cases, um, OT alone cannot establish eligibility, but once eligibility is established, they are allowed to stand alone uh, after the fact. Discharge assessments, this is something that I find comical uh, for some agencies, uh, and I don't mean that in, in a funny, good way, um, where they have uh, specific clinicians going in doing starts and discharges as a way of trying to make the OASIS more accurate uh, rather than train the staff to do the OASIS accurately uh, regardless of the discipline. And there are agencies that will have uh, non-billable visits, go, uh, nursing visits go out because the nurse did the start and then they will end up doing a non-billable uh, nursing visit at the end of that episode to do the discharge OASIS. And really this is, this is money that doesn't need to be spent in that way from the agency. Uh, properly training all clinicians to do OASIS um, is, is probably the best, I think, the best way to go rather than having a nurse do a, a non-billable visit as a workaround. Uh, if you look at the bottom, you can see OASIS C1 ICD-9 guidance manual. Um, that is available. If you do not have it, 
uh, I recommend getting that because of the major changes um, of changing the version from Oasis C to Oasis C1 uh, that just happened January 1st. Okay, but I think that's it for that slide. Let's go to talk about Quapi. Yeah, I'm going to talk about case conference and Quapi just real quickly before we talk about resetting expectations. So here are my recommendations for case conference and for Quapi. Case conference, make attendance mandatory, period. It drives a wedge between the disciplines to have different expectations for the therapist versus the nurse. Now, there may be business reasons for making some of those decisions. There may be geographical reasons for making some of those decisions. But make attendance to case conference mandatory. This is where we meet 484.14, the coordination of patient services requirement that we coordinate care and document that coordination of care uh, appropriately. Uh, the best thing about case conference is in home health, we rarely get to lay our hands on our clinicians. They're rarely in the office. And so case conference is your best opportunity, your one or two hours a week, to engage the clinicians, to lay hands on them, to say hi to them, to mentor them, to educate them, uh, and to make sure they feel like part of the team and not a siloed discipline. So use that time to educate and to engage the staff. And COPY, so if you've read the proposed uh, COP changes uh, from CMS related to home health, there's a tremendous focus and movement uh, from quality improvement that we've done forever to real QAPI, like we've done in hospice for the longest time. And QAPI requires interdisciplinary attendance, and QAPI is a very effective way to find problems and to address problems from an interdisciplinary point, and to include therapists in those discussions, to have PTs and OTs and SLPs sitting down in a QAPI team looking at readmission or hospitalization reasons and drilling down to the root cause and then coming up with a solution will lead them to the path of, oh my gosh, I need to do vital signs. I need to be a more comprehensive clinician. Uh, I'm not contributing to the team like everyone else is. It's a very effective way to engage therapists and to overcome those uh, objections to doing these very basic interventions we're talking about today. So use those PIPs or performance improvement projects to engage therapy staff when it, turn, when it comes to QAPI. So now let's talk about resetting expectations and engaging therapists as we kind of draw to an end and get ready for questions. Discuss the value of therapists. So I think it's important to do this regularly. Be bold and be honest with therapists. Uh, we regularly discuss the MedPAC recommendations regarding unlinking therapy visits and payment in home health. And so the question to therapists that I think is very reasonable to ask is at the bottom of this slide. If reimbursement changed tomorrow, what value would you bring to this agency and to our patients? We better be able to answer, we reduce readmission rates. We improve outcomes. We assist with process measures. We contribute to QAPI, and on and on and on. Those need to be the value adds that come from the therapy disciplines, and these topics are a great way to launch a good discussion. Discuss the Balanced Budget Act of 1998 and its impact on therapy. So when I came out of school and hospitals moved to the DRG reimbursement system through CMS, Therapy practices, rehabilitation in the hospital moved from a revenue center to a cost center, and it greatly impacted the role of the therapist in an acute care hospital. And I think part of the reason for that is we hadn't well established our value to patients on the inpatient side of the equation. And so we need to make sure we've done that in home health. Discuss value-based purchasing, which we believe is coming in 2016. Uh, if we're in one of those states, if you're in one of those states that is selected to uh, go through the value-based purchasing system with CMS, discuss how contributing as a full member of the team and doing these interventions will be such a huge part of the role of the clinician or the therapist in particular. And discuss home health agency star metrics, those 10 publicly reported outcome measures and process measures that are likely to contribute to star ratings for our agencies Ask therapists how they're driving your agency's performance related to those potential STAR metrics. These are great questions when we talk about the value of therapy. And so ideas, 
Have therapists in leadership and in preceptor roles engage them in the organizational structure of your agency. Standardize competencies and self-assessment. Utilize outside resources if you need to, but have those in place. Have regular therapy meetings and ensure that home health agency leadership leads the meetings. Have the branch directors or your branch managers leading those meetings. Don't let it be a therapy-only meeting and stay siloed. Bring them in. Cite industry speakers and publications. Non-therapy leaders have to become knowledgeable in our field. So if you're a nurse supervisor on this call, you've got to become somewhat of an expert or at least more knowledgeable in the therapy regulations and in the therapy trends and what's happening in the industry. Consult experts in the field. Clearly explain expectations during the interview process. So make it very clear up front that if you're going to be a therapist in this organization, you're going to take vital signs. You're going to comprehend. You're going to practice comprehensively. Include the expectations and the offer of employment. And again, engage them in COPY and medical review practices. If you have denials, let them see those and work through those. And engage them as part of the solution to the problem. So Ken has some resources, and then I think we'll be ready for questions. So if you look up at the slides right now, you'll see that, you know, the first bullet that Bud and I have shared here is, is professional associations. And, you know, this is some of the homework that we already tried to, uh, to gather information. And you'll see some of the resources we were able to find. Because this webinar is only an hour and we wanted to have uh, time for questions, we really did not have that many slides. And there are other position statements and other guidance documents available that we just didn't have the time to share at this point. So uh, know that there are other resources available. Uh, again, just you know, start Googling and, and go to the uh, association websites and you can find these resources. Uh, as, as my role as the chair of the practice committee for the home health section, uh, we just cr uh, created and uh, just published uh, with APTA uh, National uh, a book called Providing Physical Therapy in the Home, and that's a handbook. I recommend all agencies listening on the line at least go to the website, take a look at it. It's a book of 15 chapters that, that goes through all of the different uh, items that Bud and I were talking about today. It talks about physical therapists being involved with uh, doing starter care visits. It talks about physical therapists being uh, case managers. It talks about how to do a, uh, the plan of care, creating a, the care plan. It talks about proper discharging. It talks about the ICF. We've included the ICF model uh, related to therapy assessments. So there's a lot of information, and each chapter is, is well referenced, and that way you can find a, a lot more um, stuff that we already did the homework on. And um, this is a valuable, valuable resource. Uh, I feel like I'm on a soapbox now trying to sell it, but, but uh, in any, we turned the webinar into an infomercial. Uh, but I do highly recommend this uh, resource. Uh, it is available for uh, APTA members at, at a lower rate, but anybody can purchase it. And we do feel that it will become a resource, uh, a valuable resource uh, for the industry. Uh, the other document, this one's free. So if you go to the Home Health section uh, website, and that's listed here, Navigating the Sea of Home Health Regulators. This is a free document. Anybody here on the call can go to that website and, and get this document for free. And basically, we go through the different layers of uh, red tape or regulations uh, that exist. So it helps you to try to start to figure out um, if you're new to this, uh, new to home health, uh, it gives you information of where a starting point. And if you're not new to home health and you're, you're a seasoned clinician or seasoned administrator, uh, it gives you other areas to look at that may have been, um, may not have been thought about before. Uh, AOTA, ASHA, again, APTA, they're well involved, and um, definitely I would look to those for resources. Uh, State departments, you definitely you have to go to the State Practice Act because that's law, and also the, possibly the Department of Health. Um, those are law. But beyond that, as far as asking questions for clarifications of the State Practice Act, um, if the state is silent on the specific item you're researching, I would follow the other route that I already had mentioned. See if it's in the curriculum of the um, of the discipline that you're looking to have them do it, do the uh, whatever the task is. Um, very quickly, in New York State, physical therapists are not allowed to take med orders. So this is a, a challenge that we have when therapists do start a care visits, because we can't go to the physician and call them and reconcile all the medication. So we needed to have a process in place because of uh, the Department of Health um, regulation. We need to have RNs do that medication reconciliation. So that's the practice that we needed to put in place. So yes, physical therapists in New York State do uh, perform admission visits, 
However, there needs to be a process in place for the med reconciliation that takes place uh, between a nurse in the office uh, and the physician practice. Federal agencies, you know, you, we all have heard of uh, CMS and Department of Health and Human Services. So these are other resources. Um, definitely you need to follow those because those, again, are uh, federal law and regulation. So those are some ideas for some resources. Again, um, I guess the biggest recommendation I have is, you know, don't ever say this is what Bud said, this is what Ken said, uh, because we want you to go to the actual uh, source documents and get what the regulations are. And um, so that's why we share this information with you here. Hey, Bud, I have a quick question. When your agency, do you have the home health aides doing any uh, vital signs or doing daily weights for the patients that they're seeing? Uh, yes, if they've been competency. See, so think about adding the other professions, the other, you know, the paraprofessionals involved in uh, vital signs monitoring. In my agency, our, our home health aides uh, do assist with vitals and help patients to remind them to do their daily weights. Again, trying to get the patient more engaged and involved in their care plan. So with that, right. let's move on, I believe, to questions. Well, thank you so much, Bud and Ken. Great information. We do have a list of questions, and with our time short, I'm going to drop right into the questions. So, when you, the question, when you speak of PTs and OTs, are you also including PTAs and OTs? And I can let you know that the question was asked right after vital signs and during med management. Yes, so uh, that's a good question. So when we talk about uh, physical therapists, I, we're really referring to the setting or the discipline. Uh, there are different expectations for PTAs versus PTs and CODAs versus uh, OTs, obviously. Um, I would go back to the State Practice Acts and the regulations guiding their provision of care. Uh, but I will say that in our organization, the PTAs and the occupational therapy assistants also do uh, vital signs at every visit, but they do not do any role in medication management outside of uh, recognizing when there is a problem and reporting that to their supervising therapist and to the nurse. Great. Our next question is, can a therapist, and you kind of addressed it for New York, um, but I'll go ahead and ask, can the therapist take an order for a medication, and if the PT calls the med to report a high blood pressure, and the doctor gives an order to increase the BP med, can the PT take that verbal order, or does it have to go through a nurse? So I guess we're talking both medications and verbal orders for medication changes. So to answer this question, if, if I were at a patient's home, and this is now in New York, and the patient has an elevated um, blood pressure, I would not be allowed to take the med order from the physician. So what we do in that case is we would tell the physician if we were on the line with them or their agent, we would ask them to hold on one moment, put the phone on, on speakerphone so that we could hear what the order that's being told to the patient is. We will write down what that order is, and then basically we, we describe that information into a clinical note for the nursing staff to then follow up with the physician to get that med order change. So that's what we've done to, to work around the fact that we can't take the med order directly. As far as uh, taking med orders, this would be something specific to the State Practice Act. If you look at the APTA document that was uploaded this morning, it does go into many of the states in the country and what their Practice Acts say, whether they're silent uh, or restrictive or um, uh, allow uh, therapists involved in taking uh, taking those med orders. So, um, right. and this is where I would say it's one of those things we mentioned early in the presentation. Be careful what you ask for from the states. So, if the if the state is silent and you call and get an opinion from somebody in the, on the board, make sure you get that reduced to writing. We are currently um, in ongoing discussions with three different states we operate in about whether or not OTs can take orders related to medications uh, where we've been told no they can't and so we're going through the process of trying to clarify that uh, in a public statement or in writing before we move our uh, processes forward. Okay, great. Well, now I have a wound care question. How does your agency handle M2250 on patients that are receiving PT only, no skilled nursing, such as, well, diabetic foot care? I guess it's more of a question about diabetic foot care and in the care planning question. 
So I'll tell you, when we have uh, a therapist admit uh, a therapy-only patient, uh, if they happen to have um, a, a diagnosis of diabetes, it's a best practice in our company to educate on diabetic foot care. And so if they're admitting, uh, we would stick to the OASIS guidance for M2250 and uh, have them confirm that we have uh, approval for that best practice in the plan of care, and they would address that issue. Uh, and none of the states that I currently operate in do I believe that's an issue with us. Great. Okay, the next question um, is, why is the therapy loop a mess? And we're curious about that portion of the myth slide. The uh, the idea of a therapy looper, I was I believe I was in Oklahoma talking about um, providing um, information about objective testing, and the question came up. Well, we were told you can't have a therapy looper; it has to be five therapy visits or more. And you know that led to a short discussion. And the idea, if you go to the CMS regulations uh, for home health, whether you go to Chapter Seven or you go to Chapter Ten, if you go to the uh, the manuals. And no, there's no way where it mentions there, there's a such thing as a therapy lupa. And if you look at uh, what a lupa is specifically, which is in those manuals, you know, this is really a matter of, of reimbursement. And, you know, five, you know, it has to be five or more visits for therapy. Again, that has to do with what reimbursement is. There's, there's just no such thing as a therapy lupa. You know, lupas include all disciplines, four or less visits. Okay, great. I'm going to, um, go ahead and ask a question, and then Misty um, Dyke, if you would also go back to the myths. Earlier, there was a slide at the beginning about myths, and I have a, several questions there. But while she's getting there, I'm going to go ahead and ask, a patient that's receiving maintenance PT through Medicare, can that patient also be receiving home health aid services under Medicare? That's a really good question. Um, I'll answer it, and but if you want to add to the question, add what you're doing at your agency. Um, the fact is, a patient that's receiving uh, maintenance therapy or restorative therapy, they are entitled to having home health aid services. You know, either way, um, going to Chapter Seven and reading the transmittal with the update regarding the Gino Sibelius case. Uh, if you look at that, you will not see anywhere that it mentions. Um, Home health aid is not a covered service uh, under maintenance because it is a covered service. And as far as the slide here, maintenance therapy is not appropriate. Uh, this is currently one of the challenges that, that I'm facing uh, at our agency is I hear uh, clinicians that have a lot, still have a lot of um, misconceptions and urban legend regarding what is or isn't maintenance. And so what we've been trying to do is review cases uh, on a case-by-case -case basis to see if it meets what the maintenance regulations are. And uh, I think there are patients that are not receiving maintenance therapy um, that, that do qualify, unfortunately, and, and they're not getting benefits that, they, um, that they're well entitled to have. Okay, and I have another question that came in too related to maintenance therapy. So when maintenance therapy is initiated, are the visits done by PTs and OTs and not PTAs or, or CODAs? So that under is the current true, but you can answer that one. Yeah, under the current regulations, maintenance therapy can only be rendered by therapist and not assistants. Okay, great. Now the questions were excellent, by the way, for everyone that sent uh, questions in. There were several questions related to the common myths, and I know we are at the top of the hour, but we really did have great questions. So if you got, if you can hand stay on for a few more minutes, we'll go ahead and handle the last of these questions. Um, so the question related to some of the common myths, could you state a little bit more information about the two myths, the homebound status versus the 150 feet and the 10 visit rule? Hey, but I'll take homebound and you take the 10 visit rule. How about that? Sure. Oh yeah, for sure. Okay. So as far as the homebound status, there was, um, Urban legend that a patient that ambulates 151 feet or greater, uh, that makes them no longer homebound and that, you know, that would end the episode. And if you go to the homebound definition, which was uh, updated last year, I believe December, I, I'm trying to go off, off my mind, um, of 2013, the homebound regulations changed, um, November actually, I think. If you look at the definition, it does not have any indication related to a, a, a distance that makes a patient homebound or not. And um, patient being covered for uh, services related to homebound, 
Um, that 150 feet rule, I believe, came from uh, the FEM, where there's 150 feet is a, is a demarcation related to the FEM instrument, which is not a home health uh, industry instrument. It's a uh, inpatient uh, rehab instrument. So it's just urban legend that's still that's still rampant out there um, related to if a patient walks greater than that distance, they're not all that. That's just simply not true. Uh, however, charts that have been denied that have greater distances, you really need to just to uh, be very clear in your documentation why they still need therapy, whether it's stairs or, or what other um, issues the patient has that makes them homebound. Uh, when I see charts denied for 151 feet, uh, that's really not because of the 150 alone. It's the fact that the chart doesn't have other information that's needed to be there to support the homebound status. Great. Yeah, and I would I would just reiterate on that 150 foot rule. The Medicare manual is clear to say that. Uh, Medicare cannot apply rules of thumb in order to deny patient services, and that would be an example of a guideline that somebody has been has discussed uh, that cannot be applied for the purposes of medical review or denials. Uh, related to that second bullet point, the 10 visit rule, 6, 14, 20 visit rules, and therapy lupus, that bullet point is really to highlight the problem we have where therapists practicing in the home health setting don't fully understand the reimbursement methodology for home health PPS. And so because they don't fully understand, uh, in the past and likely still currently, some therapists are misled by agencies, uh, not necessarily malintentioned, uh, to say, you know, in the past prior to 2008, uh, well, we don't get paid for therapy services unless you do 10 visits. Well, that's not exactly true. At 10 visits was when the um, increased incremental reimbursement, uh, increased uh, in the old methodology of reimbursement. Since 2008, these stair-stepped ladders for reimbursement have been in place for therapy related to the number of therapy visits provided, all disciplines together. And so this bullet point is really highlighting that there are no rules where Medicare doesn't say you have to do six visits to be paid for therapy services. Uh, or if you do less than six, to Ken's point earlier, uh, that somebody has termed the coin uh, or coined the term therapy lupa. These are things that are not exactly consistent with the regulations and with the reimbursement methodology. And the point there uh, that we really try to drive home is therapists practicing in the setting need to understand the rules and the reimbursement and the regulations so that they don't hear these kind of, of grumblings or myths uh, and then incorporate them into their practice, if that makes sense. Wonderful. Well, we were getting close to the end of our questions, but we have a lot of new questions that have come in that are great. So what we're going to do is finish at the Q&A session. All of your questions, we've captured those, and we will address those um, with Ken and Bud and ask them to respond. And we'll post um, the responses afterwards, because they were all brilliant questions and day-to-day -day practice issues that you're facing at your organization. So with that being said, do make sure you do the evaluation after the session is over and provide the number of people and also topics that you'd like to hear about. We will be using and having Ken and Bud back for other conversations uh, related to other topics because this was just the tip of the iceberg of the many different conversations we know that you want to hear about. So keep informed by watching the HHQI um, newsletter, the Inside Edition, and um, we hope that we'll see you back again in the future, and HHQ, I would like to really thank Bud and Ken for such a great presentation today. Thank you very much.